Good morning. Uh, this is Finance 530, and we're going to be talking about the international monetary system in this brief section. So, um, the international monetary system is, um, in, is you know, globe-spanning, it's complex, it's, it constitutes the rules of and mechanisms by which um, international trade happens, how um, banks interact with each other across nation-state lines, and um, how capital moves across the, you know, the, the world and makes economic activity happen um, all over the globe. It is, um, it is integrated, it is complicated, and, um, and it is um, significantly affected by um, local legal regulation. So you'll see as we um, talk about different aspects of the system, how different policy decisions by governments and central banks have a strong effect on how this looks. So um, there, the international monetary system has changed over time. Um, if you think about, uh, you know, think about the, the Spanish conquering the new world and sending a whole bunch of precious metal back to Europe, um, obviously there, there are some practical uses for gold. Um, in jewelry and other things, but the reality is, for at that time, most of that gold was. I mean, the assumption was that then they would use that as money in exchange for goods and services. But that's not actually providing anything valuable to Europe. It's just providing gold to Europe without actually increasing the size of the economic pie in Europe. And so uh, the Spanish importing a bunch of gold into Europe actually um, caused really significant inflation and disproportionately benefited the Spanish over the rest of um, rest of Europe. So you can imagine, you know, in, in, in modern society, um, the rest of Europe, might have gotten together and said, hey, we're just not going to accept gold as a form of exchange and we're going to ban gold reserves and um, and basically make all of that Spanish, you know, conquered money, wor you know, worthless or worth significantly less. But that kind of understanding and coordination would have happened back then. And plus, you know, there was just sort of this longstanding, you know, assumption about the value of gold and that it had been used the same way for thousands of years. And so um, it would have been probably impossible for them to conceive at that time that anything other than, um, than uh, valuable gold could be. Um, and so the, so we, the, Right, the, the text describes this the uh, monetary system before 1875 is bimetallism. The other metal is silver. And so you get kind of this, you know, situation where you have um, you know, gold and silver that are both utilized as money, and they often would have some sort of fixed exchange rate that wasn't actually really reflective of the true value. So you can imagine something like, if you have 17, if, if, if you say it's 17 units of silver is one unit of gold, but the true um, difference in exchange rate should be maybe something like 31. Well, that would mean that silver is worth more than it should be in terms of gold. And that would mean if you've got gold and silver, you'd want to spend the silver and keep the gold hidden, right? Because you're basically losing when you transact gold for silver. So you just wouldn't see much gold being used. And so while these exchange rates were, um, exchange between gold and silver being fixed, then you just have, you know, the one driving the other out. 
But that does mean that whatever metal medium was being used would be used, right? So you have, you know, gold coins or silver coins, and you would, you know, actually circulate them. So if you think, you know, and there's an old Kevin Costner movie, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and they raid the sheriff of Nottingham's coach, and there's a wooden chest full of actual metal, right? I mean, we think about pirate treasure, it's not paper currency. So they spent a long time with actual physical currency, generally silver or gold. And, and then from, um, from 1875 to 1914, um, things changed a little bit. So um, there was an international agreement to really focus on, on gold or at least it sort of, you know, be, became one in practice over time. And so you have a lot of just, you know, so we have it. Yeah. Like exchange, um, transactions going on in gold or right. You have, um, you can have to a currency, right? You can have national currency like the pound that's convertible between gold. And so you might use the currency, right? You might use the British pound, but it is um, at any point you could, you know, turn it in for gold or, or it's effectively backed by gold. And so, and countries would, you know, pay a lot of attention to whether they had enough gold to support their currency. And, uh, and that's, you know, really how things operated for some time. Now you get, so that basically fell apart in World War I or, you know, or close after or right around then. Um, 1914, that's, you know, right around the time of the founding of the Federal Reserve. So we have, um, you know, the United States. I mean, we, so the U.S. had a, a history of, with central banking, you know, Andrew Jackson famously, you know, de-chartered the Bank of the United States, I think maybe it was the second Bank of the United States. But, um, but since, you know, 1914-ish, we've had um, uh, a, a, a central bank that um, has managed the currency. And so, um, but when you have, okay, so when you have a, a gold standard where you're making your currency trade at a fixed ratio with respect to gold, then convertibility between currencies is easy because, you know, if the one, if 35 us dollars is one ounce of gold and six pounds is one ounce of gold, then you can, you know, just do a quick division and figure out how much of one gets you to how much of the other. And you can count on that happening for a long time. Um, because the idea was to keep all these things stable. And so it's really convenient for trade because you don't really have to worry about, um, you don't really have to worry about what currency your trade is happening in because you're not going to lose on the exchange. I mean, it matters in the sense of transactions costs. You have to work with, you'd have to work with the bank and, and pay for the handling of the money, but you're not going to be in a situation where, you know, I bought a bunch of goods for dollars. I sent them to Great Britain, was paid for them in pounds, brought the pounds back to the United States six months later, exchanged those pounds for dollars and got beat up on the exchange because that wasn't the, it wasn't really happening because we were, all these currencies were at stable ratios to gold. So it made trade a lot easier and it enforced a lot of fiscal discipline on countries because if they, you know, produced more currency than they had gold to support it, then they could end up with a run on their gold reserves because people would say, oh, there, there's too many of these. And so I want to convert them to gold quickly before it, you know, before it gets devalued. And so countries would want to project monetary strength so that they didn't have to worry about that kind of concern. Um, and so there's, yeah, so there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, the real challenge though, of trying 
to do this is um, the value of currencies really to a great degree depend on the transaction volume in the currency itself, right? If I'm, you know, we just think if I, if there's $10 bills in circulation and we're trying to buy several thousand things a day using those $10 bills, there's going to be a lot of pressure to, you know, subdivide them into cents and use those cents to buy things. And it would mean prices would be very low. Whereas if you have, you know, several million dollars and you're only trying to transact 10 things, then naturally there is going to be, you know, more dollars per transaction. And of course these things drift over time. So it's not, so that's, I mean, I guess the the real challenge is if you say, okay, well, we're going to try to keep the British pound fixed at six pounds per ounce and the dollar fixed at $35 per ounce. But then the U S economy grows faster than the British economy well, then you get in a situation where it's hard for Great Britain to, su- to support their gold exchange rate because now there's way more transactions happening in U.S. dollars, but we don't have, um, you know, we don't have an additional supply of dollars to support those transactions easily, right? I mean, the U.S. could acquire more gold, but I mean, I really, I guess, kind of the the point is that all of these countries had different economic policies. They had different boons and disasters befall them. And so it's very natural that the relative strength of countries' economies and therefore the relative strength of companies, countries' currencies would drift over time. And there was no way to allow for that drift in a classic gold standard. And so you end up in a situation where you get currencies that are systematically over or undervalued relative to each other. And that over time, this can be in a situation where the market perceives the difference between the actual value of the currency and the value of the precious metal backing it to be so incongruous that they do effectively a run on the bank. Um, also, this, the in the slides, there's this last point, there's no mechanisms to compel each country to abide by the rules, right? So if if I'm a country and I decide to have a irresponsible fiscal policy, then my currency can end up worth, a, you know, I could have a lot of currency and not a lot of precious metal. And it's in the best interest for everyone that there isn't, um, that, 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 that peg, that, that, gold standard is maintained. And so it basically allows um, countries with poor fiscal discipline to free ride on everyone else's desire to keep the gold standard going. And we saw something similar to that in, um, in Greece. So when Greece was adopted into the European Monetary Union, they um, spent then a lot of time not having strict fiscal policy and, and, um, and, you know, got incurred significant debt denominated in euros. And then it became a threat to, you know, so if Greece were to default on its euro debt, then that could have negative consequences for euro denominated debt throughout the eurozone. And so then the other European Union countries were forced to support Greece, in particular Germany, right, support Greece um, through their currency crisis to support the euro broadly, but then they were also, you know, uh, annoyed, right? They were very frustrated at Greece fiscal policy. And so then they were basically in- insisting on some changes. And then there was a lot of debate on how much austerity do you force on Greece? What's the, I mean, what's the right amount? And, you know, so, um, so yeah, so this, it just ends up not being very flexible, which means it ends up not, um, not realistically being viable for the long term, probably, and we do right see it fall apart. So you get to um, right. So uh, from 1915 to 1944, you know, so World War One, the that 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 gold standard falls apart, and so then we have um, the uh, you know this really. You know, the interwar period where it just every things are 
basically f free floating. There's no coherent strategy at all. It, it adversely affects international trade. Um, also, people aren't, I mean, countries aren't really used to navigating tran currency translation risk. And, um, and so it ends up, you know, the, the, I mean, obviously the twenties were good economically in the United States, but it was, you know, that the interwar period wasn't great for, um, for global, global trade. So post-World War II, um, there was a, a sort of return to the gold standard in kind of a back, uh, an end around way. So um, the nations got together at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and agreed to a monetary system fixed to the dollar instead of gold. But then the dollar was going to be fixed to gold. So instead of everybody trying to manage their own connection to gold and to maintain gold reserves, they could just maintain dollar reserves and then the dollar would maintain gold reserves. So that's, so you think about all the gold in Fort Knox. Well, that's part of why we think about that that way is that the United States actually had the primary responsibility for handling the precious metal part of the monetary system for almost 30 years. And, um, and so that, you know, when we talk about the dollar as the reserve currency, um, if you've heard that in the news or people talk about, oh, you know, it's the, the, the dollar as reserve currency is going to end and it's going to get replaced by the euro or by the renminbi or something. You know, a lot of this is, you know, going back to thinking about what happened in the 40s and 50s and 60s where countries would, you know, have fixed exchange rates with the dollar and then the dollar had a fixed exchange rate with gold, stabilizing everything. So again, though, you have this sort of the same problem where you have a whole bunch of countries connected to fixed exchange rates effectively with the dollar and gold. And a lot of economies were severely devastated by the war. Um, but one thing that's true about having a devastated economy is that it's easier to restore a damaged infrastructure and economy than it is to build new economy and infrastructure green, greenfield, right? So even though the United States has an economic advantage and that other than Pearl Harbor, we didn't really suffer any domestic damage to our economic infrastructure, it meant that the exchange rates fixed in Bretton Woods um, drifted away from reality over time. And so the, this idea that we could just, you know, all have currencies that trade with the dollar pegged to gold um, was, you know, we can say, I guess, with historical hindsight, we can see, okay, we tried this effectively once already, and it didn't work because of currencies, com countries, economies drifting relative to each other. So now here we go again. And once again, it failed. But um, so it, it, it is really beneficial for all the reasons we mentioned before, right? You have a lot of, um, you don't have to move a bunch of gold around, which is nice. You can just do dollar, you know, you know, you get dollar deposits. You can transmit electronically between banks. Um, and you have these nice stable exchange rates, but, um, but you have, okay. So, so that reserve currency though, is kind of in an interesting situation and in that, that reserve currency has to run a balance of payments deficit um, to satisfy the need for other countries to have reserves. So, you know, we talk about, um, you know, if you've maybe you've heard in the news that the U.S. has a trade deficit and we've had a trade deficit for a long, long time. So um, I'm going to, you know, part of this class will be recontextualizing even what it means, what a trade deficit means. Um and, 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 the, and the significance of it economically, that's not for this lecture, but in principle, you can think about, well, okay, a trade deficit um, in, in the short means that I am going to um, send dollars overseas in exchange for goods and services, right? And so, and also, right, I'm going to export goods and then receive, you know, foreign currencies in exchange for those. 
And so there's, you know, a, a route and then we, and then you would trade, right? I have my foreign currency I got from selling and I'll trade it for dollars. And that if it's all in balance, then that would all balance out. And the Bretton Woods system effectively required it to not balance because there would always, always be demand overseas for dollars to hold in reserves so that you could, you know, transact internationally, right? If you wanted to, if I'm in the UK and I want to transact with, you know, somebody in, you know, Yugoslavia or something, then I would need, then you route through dollars, right? Everybody, you just trade in dollars and that sort of becomes the medium. So there's this huge demand for dollars, which drives up the value of the dollar, <clears throat> which makes American exports not competitive and international imports very competitive in the U.S., and that actually just makes dollars flow internationally. So that is persistent over a long time, but then you get, right, this situation where you have a whole bunch of dollars overseas that people are then wondering, well, am I going to be able to buy things with this? What if the United States decides to devalue? And, and so... Um, so if this system ever, you know, begins to show cracks, then people, you know, countries that hold extensive dollar reserves might decide to, you know, if they, if it's looking like it's in trouble, they might choose to abandon it to get ahead of the curve and, and get rid of their dollars before they plummet in value. And so it becomes kind of a precarious position for the dollar to be in, even though it, what well, you know, had significant advantages over those 30 years because of it. So, um, uh, so this didn't last forever. And so in 19, um, so, in, you know, so in seven, the sort of over like those three years from 73 to 76 there, you know, there was stress in the, you know, the U S gold exchange rate. And, um, and again, you, you saw that this, you know, this U S dollar, is pegged at $35 an ounce. This is back in, you know, in this late sixties, early seventies. And now we know, I mean, gold trades in the, you know, around $2,000 an ounce range, right? So there's been dramatic drop in value of the U S dollar relative to the promised exchange rate during the Bretton Woods era. And, and the reality was right. That the price of gold should have been appreciating throughout the Bretton Woods era. And it wasn't allowed to. And that led to, you know, t challenges that ultimately culminated in the disappear, you know, that whole arrangement falling apart in the early seventies. And so that was, um, officially declared dead in the Jamaica arrangement. And, um, and so then currencies were just basically allowed to free float. And so every country itself decided in what way it was going to respond to this now ability to freely trade currencies across international boundaries. And so there's a wide variety of how this, how, what forms this will take, um, which we'll get to in a second. But if you look here, this is um, the effective um, way to trade weighted value of U.S. dollars since 1964. And so you can see there, there was um, a negative effect with the collapse of that, of the Bretton Woods Agreement. But you know, there, it's not, it wasn't as a precipitous drop as you'd think. Again, the dollar is falling massively relative to gold in this time, right? So here, gold is $35 an ounce. Here, it's $2,000 an ounce. So, so there's an incredible decline in the value of the dollar relative to gold over this time. But the dollar relative to other currencies, so other currencies are also collapsing relative to gold during this era as well, right? So uh, relative to other currencies, there are ups and downs and a general trend down. Um, but that, you know, really sort of indicates probably the, you know, the economic growth outside of the United States in some locations has been on average slightly smaller. Not that other countries are, you know, like China, obviously, for a long time was competitive, you know, looked like it could have, you know, approach, you know, G total GDP in China past the United States. Um, but you know, if, if I'm, for example, say in Botswana where GDP per capita was really, really low, but is improving rapidly relative to the United States that, you know, that's going to affect the relative values of those currencies because 
of course, you know, if you're starting from a position that's way lower, right? So, um, so yeah, so you can see the, um, the coming and going, and right, you can see the technology boom had a very positive effect on the American dollar. Uh, well, why would that be? Well, again, if you sort of think holistically, right, a big part of the value of dollar relative to other currencies are the goods and services you can purchase with it. And, you know, in the web 1.0 era, there were so many, you can imagine all of the um, technologies and services, other, you know, foreign companies were hoping to get access to, or maybe buying dollars in anticipation of getting access to. And so that creates a relative demand for the US dollar and makes it more valuable over time. And then as that web 1.0 bubble collapsed, so did the that added value of the dollar. But all in all, you can see this isn't this isn't a huge drift, right? We go from, you know, and 100, you know, you know this is, right, a, all, you know, trade weighted value of the dollar goes from 140 units to 120 over however, you know, four, uh, 60 years almost. So, um, yeah, the US, I mean, the U.S. currency relative to global currencies has been pretty stable, even in the floating exchange rate era. And so this is normalizing 2010 at 100. That's, that's what that is. So, yeah, so, and as I mentioned before, well, um, the, the, in order, in response to the floating exchange rate, um, countries had to decide how they were going to manage their own currencies on the international stage. And that took, um, many, many different forms. So we will, um, get to that in the next part of this lecture.